Well, let's connect this into the present day. Um, and one thing that is um, a constant reoccurring theme is the reptilians or an extraterrestrial race interbreeding with humanity and creating particular bloodlines. And you've got an amazing um, ar artifact, I guess that's the word, a uh, necklace here, which I know is incredibly heavy, which um, has a very significant contribution to make to this theme of extraterrestrials or another race, not human, interbreeding with humanity. Now, first of all, wh where did this come from? So, we don't know. This necklace has been around for so long that we don't exactly know from which tribe it came. All I can tell you is that this necklace was in existence when the king who founded the Zulu nation, Zulu, was still a boy. It is described in ancient legends centering around this king. It is called Inweba Yezimfilo, the necklace of the mysteries. It is really a book which tells 12 different stories. And how old do you think it is? How long do you, how old do you know it is, first of all? I don't know, sir. All I do know is that... Hundreds of years, sir? Yes. Yes, very old. But it's not as old as the green face that I've just shown you. Oh, the Chitauli the face uh, is said to be over 7,000 years old, this thing here. Now, this necklace enshrines several mysteries in it. Inside here are stones which are not from this earth. It is a very amazing story. There are three pebbles in here which stories say were brought to this earth by an alien baby which played with a human baby in the northern Transvaal. This... First of all, that, that looks so much just well. It's, it obviously looks very much like a, like a, a spacecraft. A, like a man, man, done it. Yeah. Yes. Sir. This... This half-molten object here used to be a serpent-like necklace worn by a Mashona chief. He went to investigate something which had landed in the bush and which was killing his people. And he went with his battle axe to attack this object. And the object blew a jet of very terrible fire at the chief and he he became just smoke and this was all that was left of him now this necklace enshrines one of the oldest and the greatest mysteries in our country that the, the God beings which we call by the name Chidauri and which are called Zishwezi or Imanugela in the languages of other tribes throughout Africa. These gods came down to the earth in great... Uh, 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 vessels made out of gold and they united with female human beings to create a race of kings and queens on our earth. There isn't a tribe, Mr. Ike, anywhere in Africa. And when you return to South Africa, I will ask you to investigate this very closely. 
there isn't a tribe anywhere in southern, central, western, and eastern Africa which doesn't claim that kingship was a system that was brought down from the sky by gods who either traveled in swings, as the pygmies of Zaire say, or who came down in huge vessels which were shaped like bows, vessels made of gold, vessels bigger than mountains. I wish to share these things with you, say, as briefly as I can. The Zulu people believed that they originated from space, and their name Zulu does not mean sky, but rather interplanetary space. And the word Zulu also has to do with traveling. For example, if I say to a child, you are getting about, you are moving from village to village lazily, I say, we are Zula, when? Now the word Zula, which is used to refer to Zulus, sometimes contemptuously, in Zula, means really a traveler, a voyager, somebody moving from place to place. Where? In the Izu. Now I ask you, how did a land-bound people like the Zulus know that you could travel in space? We are Zula, a Zuluini. You can travel in the great place of traveling. For that matter, Zulu people knew that the earth was a sphere and that it was the sun that was still in space and the various planets orbited around it. I will show you on the other necklace of knowledge. And when a Zulu refers to the earth, he says, umhlaba jigelele. Now, the word jigelele implies a spherical or a hemispherical object, but a Musutu or a Mutswana from Lesotho or from Botswana will refer to the world as Lifazi, which means that which is down here. And he will say, when he refers to the earth's shape, Lifazi Ka Bupara. Now this word Ka Bupara means the earth in its width. Thus, a Musutu or a Mutswana believes that the earth is flat, but the Zulus believe it is either a hemisphere or a sphere. The Zulu people were the first people to know something that is now attributed to Albert Einstein, namely that Space and time are one and the same thing. Zulus knew that long before Einstein was born. They said that one other Zulu name for space is Umkati. Umkati. U M K H A T H I. Umkati. And they called time easy card. So you can see sir, that Zulus, supposedly a nation of skin-wearing primitives, were aware of the fact that space and time are one and the same thing. And further, that if you could find the river of time, you could travel into the future and into the past. And many are the ancient legends which are told in Zululand of a man 
who traveled to through time and accidentally killed a young boy who turned out to be himself in the past and so he no longer existed anymore. There's an indication on the necklace, uh, I know, uh, around the back that the earth is round. One of the symbols is indicating that, or a sphere. Yes. But I, I wonder what you um, think, uh, Credo, of what is taught to children and students all over the world in the universities and the fancy academic centers that actually we are now at the cutting edge of human evolution in terms of technological knowledge and knowledge of the world and the universe and in fact um, back in the um, ancient world in Africa and North Africa and all over South America they were just a primitive people. Please, that is a lot of poppycock. In fact, in my long investigation into our past I can tell you proudly that our ancestors were 20 times cleverer than we are. What I feel and what I think say, is that in the past human beings were cleverer than we are today and that human beings knew more than we know now. We are not progressing, Mr. Ike. We are simply rediscovering things that were known by better men and better women than we are thousands of years ago. I wish to offer you proof of this, some of it at least. Say, there are things that I have found in my travel through the world, things that prove to me that our ancestors were highly advanced in chemistry. Our ancestors had become so clever that they could, they could take science and reduce it to such a simple level that they were able to help hundreds of starving human beings after some traumatic happening in the past. Let's um, concentrate on some of the images on the yes. necklace and the symbols because uh, that leaves no doubt that a lot of knowledge has been around for a very much longer time than, than yes. we are ever told. First of all on the hand I'm seeing uh, the eye now the all-seeing eye and the, uh, the symbol of the eye is one the Illuminati use all the time. And, and it's one, of course, that was a very big symbol of ancient Egypt, the eye of Ra and what have you. Why is that eye there on that hand? That represents the terrible eye of the Chitawuli, the eye which sees everything, the eye which knows everything. It is said that when a Chitawuli dies, he passes his dead eye onto his next of kin. And to the Chitauli, an eye is a very, very powerful symbol. This is the eye of the Chitauli. And, but there is more to this thing. Sir. Here there is a hole that goes right through the copper. Now, if you put water in that hole, you end up with a, a, a simple magnifying microscope and you can see gems through that water. The magnification is amazing. The, the great symbol is pointed out again and again um, on the dollar bill, which is on the reverse of the Great Seal of the United States, yes. put on there by the Illuminati, a president called Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, is the all-seeing eye. Um, and so, I is it your understanding that the all-seeing eye, when it's used by the Illuminati, represents this third eye of the Chetahuli? Yes, I do. I really am sure of this. Why? Because in Africa, even ordinary human eyes are regarded as a very powerful devices of magic. If an African shows you respect, he mustn't stare at you, but he must stare at a point beyond one of your shoulders. 
Now we call this so clonipa, which means deny me your eyes. We believe say, that when emotionally roused, an ordinary human being can inflict great damage on another human being by the f unseen fires that emanate from one's eyes. We believe that we m a, a, a Zulu warrior must never allow his dying enemy to look at him. For example, when a Zulu was killing an enemy, he used to cover that enemy's face with his shield to prevent the enemy looking upon him with his eyes and putting a curse upon him. It's interesting, people um, who've experienced uh, the Chittahuli, the reptilians, um, in relationship to the British royal family and others at various rituals have said that um, at the point of sacrifice, the point of death in the sacrifice, that these reptilians stare into the eyes of the person dying, which would kind of fit why those, those warriors were very concerned about that. Yes, sir. What are they doing then? We have got a ritual, sir, which covers many fields. A ritual which is called Ukutata Umoya, taking away the soul where when a king is dying and he is fighting to pass on his knowledge and his courage to his successor, he would demand that the successor should stare heavily into the dying king's eyes. And also, when a creature is being sacrificed in Africa, whether it's a human being or an animal, that creature must be stared at by the sacrificer so that its spiritual characteristics are drunk in by the one sacrificing it. I, I have seen many times on hunting expeditions in Kenya, Tanzania and other parts of Africa when a lion is just about to breathe its last, the hunter, one of the hunters, will stare into the lion's eyes until the lion's eyes start glazing in death. It is drinking in the soul. We believe say, that the eyes are not just for seeing that they are for taking as well. Now, on the hand uh, here is what looks like the symbol of the constellation of Orion. Um, what's the significance of that? Say, people throughout Africa believe that the original human beings either came from Orion or the gods for whom read the Chitauli and many other alien nasties actually come from that constellation. We call it the constellation of Umhambi, the one who travels very, very far away. And we call this constellation also the constellation of Matsieng, the giant who was sent by God to this earth to create uh, 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 the first human beings. Matsieng was accompanied by a male lion with a very black mane. And he was also accompanied by his dog. And he traveled throughout the world he first created the first race of human beings and he was, they were so stupid in appearance that he buried them alive in, the cave, in a cave. And then he created the next race of human beings which was clever and we are 
the descendants of that race. Also on the um, hand is the, what we would call today the Star of David, which of course is not actually a Jewish symbol. It started being used uh, quite relatively recently uh, uh, in that sense, uh, uh, but it's actually a symbol that's been found all over the ancient world. What's the significance of that being on the hand? I say, there are several interpretations of this very powerful uh, 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 magical symbol. We say that there are actually two universes living side by side. A female universe, which is our universe, and a male universe. And to Sanusis, these two triangles, a triangle facing downwards, represents the descending female principle, and a triangle going upwards represents the rising male principle. It is a symbol of the unity of the feminine and the masculine. It is in fact the symbol, a very important symbol of duality. Is this the kind of um, shape of spacecraft, etc., or flying craft that um, the uh, beings from other planets were no, supposed sir. to have flown in or not? No. This, you see, sir, there are various shapes. There are spacecrafts which are shaped like boomerangs or balls. Mm -hmm. These are very, very, very big. Then there are spacecraft which are shaped like pipes, like huge pipes roughly pointed at either end. And out of those huge pipes come these little things here. Yeah. They are carried inside these huge pipes. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Now, <coughs> if we could talk about this fella. Um, yes, first sir. of all, um, the, the, the penis and all this stuff, did, that relates, uh, I would have thought, to the, the penis of Osiris uh, in Egyptian legend and, and the same recurring theme. Um, would that be along the right lines? We say, say, that King Samahong, who is represented here, yeah. the lord of all the Chitauri, call them what you will, had his penis cut off by Prince Muari, an African hero, and he replaced it with a golden one. Originally, we are told, this thing was made of gold. And now each time when we recall the story of the great marriage between human women and Chitauri men, we unite. These creatures symbolically. And sometimes when the necklace is lying on the ground, we, we make a bed out of animal skin for these two figures and then we lay them side by side and cover them with a, a small skin. So, um, why um, are the depictions of the gods um, if they were reptilian, why are they not constantly reptilian? Why are they symbolized in other forms? Because uh, it is very, very, very forbidden to portray a Chitawuli as it really is. Only in that large green head do we see a Chitawuli represented more or less as it is. So this was dictated by the Chittahuli from yes. the start, was it? Yes. All along? It was, you are not allowed to represent the sons of the python as they really are. Then you are really in trouble. If you want to talk about the Chittahuli, you must either play with shadows, you must place an image of a Chittahuli against a light, and project its shadow onto the wall. 
So, so you've got a fish, I know, um, um, on the necklace as well, and fish, yes. fish are scaled. Is this anything to do with the symbolic representation of the Chittahuli in, yes, in, a, in a way that they couldn't do it openly? Yes, sir. The also, there is a particular Chittahuli who is called Wawane by our people. Wawane was one of the few good Chittahuli because there are also some good people amongst them. Mm -hmm. And Wawane had a brother called Mpangu. According to one of the great stories, they erupted a terrible war on the Red World where human beings had originally been created. And this war was between men and women. Sir. Mama, sir. Yes, sir. And in this world, men and women nearly decimated each other. But they were rescued by the Earth Mother, who sent a great Nganyamba, that is, a great dragon, to come out of the sky to take them into its stomach and to bring them down to, not to our Earth, to a beautiful watery world near the, the star of the red dog in Jebovu, which the white people call Sirius, the star of anger. They, human beings, were settled, but human beings started eating creatures which they found in the sea, which they thought were fishes, but which were really human beings. Human beings, we are told, started eating the Chitawuli who lived in the sea, according to one story. And the Chitawuli fought back against human beings. They attacked them with tornadoes. They attacked them with, with tidal waves. And the human race was nearly wiped out. And then two brothers, two Chitawuli youths, Mpangu, and Wawan took pity upon the human race and they went into the sky and looked for a great egg and they hollowed out this egg, emptied its contents out and brought the egg to that world and loaded the surviving human beings and brought them to our world here. We say, say that Wawan gave us the power of kingship. He brought it out of the sky. And if you notice, in many parts of Africa, ancient kings used to wear a wooden helmet with golden horns. It was true in West Africa, and it was true also in Southern Africa in the great Munumutapa Empire. The horns representing the, the Chittahuli. Yes, uh, the power of the Chittahuli. Because to a Chittahuli, horns are not just for goring other Chittahuli as oxen go each other. No, horns are a symbol of status and through its horns, a Chitauli is able to communicate with human beings far across the, the, the face of the earth. So the horns were like antennae then? Yes, they were instruments of projecting power. In fact, it is said by storytellers that King Samahongo punishes those Chitauli who show mercy to human beings by pointing at them so that both their horns fall off their heads. And the Chitauri is therefore unable to, to, to direct human affairs through his or her horns.
it's also interesting that you know, the, the descriptions of the Chittahuli um, with the, the horns and the, sometimes the tail and stuff is very, very close to how uh, Christians and uh, those sort of stories have depicted the devil. Yes, and one thing that interests me is this, that depictions of the devil have, have subtly changed over the centuries. But there is a difference now. First, originally, the devil was depicted as a hook, hook-nosed creature, like a caricature of a North African moor. That was at the time when the Europeans were fighting the Moors as well as the Ara Arabs during the Crusades. Many depictions of the devil then show the devil as having a hooked nose. And then later, somewhere in the 19th century AD, the devil was depicted as an African with a snub nose, thick lips, and very dark skin. But what amazes me is that now, more than ever before, the devil is represented as a child. What What concerns me, sir, is this, that these alien creatures are now about to reveal themselves and they are making us aware of how they look like. If you look, for example, at, at uh, bioscope films which were made in the 1950s, the 30s, and, and so on, depictions of space aliens of that time are ridiculous, very lovable, but not anymore. Sir. Today, we are having films that depict the grey aliens exactly as they really are and the Chitauli exactly as they really are. My question is why? Are we being prepared for a major event? And let me share this with you. The group of American people who came to visit me a week or so ago and who left a rather unveiled threat about me shutting up or else my wife will die, who warned me about a certain creature called Eleazar or Melchizedek, that this creature is watching me, these people say, said this, that on Lake Titicaca there is a hidden beam of light coming from the sky onto the surface of that South American lake and that on the 9th of September 1999 something very interesting is going to happen at Titicaca. Now I'm interested to know what this is. Well, I know from my own travels to that area that um, there are endless sightings of uh, craft and, and beings in that area. I've been there twice myself. And I, I, I do think, from, again, from my own research, Credo, that um, we are being prepared for these uh, beings to openly um, be seen. And being prepared this way, sir, we, when we do see the, the nasties, we are not going to react to them with the fear that we would otherwise have reacted. Mm -hmm. Because now what, what game is someone playing? I think so, that they are playing the game that whoever they are, that we should accept these beings and welcome them with open arms mm -hmm. and make them our masters. Uh, yet again. You see, sir, 
there has been a steady build up in books, in children's comics, and in other things of the fact that we must accept these creatures. It started with the, with the film E.T., where a cute little alien creature got lost on Earth and fought hard to be accepted by human beings. I think the same thing is on the cards here. The question is why? The One other thing I would just like to raise before we move into the, the, the bloodlines and their yes. connection to the Illuminati is one thing that keeps coming up in, in my work is that some of these um, Chittahuli, these reptilians, um, at a high level of their hierarchy are actually white. Have you come across that? Yes. They are not white like white people. If you take if you take white cardboard and you soak it in dirty water, that is the color you will get. That is the color of the chitaul. And wait, sir, let us think carefully about this. According to African storytellers, the chitaul have got cold blood. They feel cold very quickly. And where they dwell, under the earth where the great sun god banished them. They dwell there surrounded by great fires because their blood is cold. They freeze eternally. And so if you come across them in, cave, in their caves, there are many, many cooking fires lit there. That's interesting, with the symbolism of the devil being mm -hmm. in the fires of hell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And there is another thing. The, the, the Chitaul, they, their eyes, terrible as they are, are so efficient that if a Chitaul appears suddenly into the hot African sunlight, two things happen to him. His skin dries and blisters, and he goes totally blind. In fact, sir, there have been a strange race of aliens which have been seen in Africa, even by white people, which I think are actually Chitawuli. When you, the, you run and the thing chases you, it stops immediately when a car's headlights hit it and it becomes blind. Another thing, we are told amongst our people that a Sangoma must always have a bogo. This is a sharpened wooden stick which he or she must carry at night. We are told that a sharpened stick is the only weapon by which you can kill a chitaut. Well, of course, again and again as you speak, uh, what comes to mind is the story of Dracula. Count Dracula, the stake in the heart, the blood drinker, the, the blood drinking, uh, which is precisely uh, what this uh, Chittahuli and their crossbreed seem to be into. But uh, it is not just any wood that you must use against a Chittahuli. We believe that Rhodesian teak, a wood which has got a strange bitter taste, is the one type of wood that is poisonous to the Chitaul. And down there, you see a long stick that I am carving in preparation for the year 2000. I might not be alive to see the year 2012, but this stick, which I've been working upon for the last five years, is going to be the one stick which my successor will carry 
and it will end in a sharp point. This, this wood, rotation tick, is the wood that we say can actually kill a chitauli. And where the chitauli are found, you find rotation tick or any other tick trees either being felled in large quantities or being pushed over by elephants. May I point out to you, sir, that many of the trees that are being destroyed in the Amazon jungle and in the southeast Af East southeastern Asian jungles as well as in the African jungles are teak, the one wood that the cheetah would fear. And while on the subject of wood, the only mask that can protect you against the cheetah is a mask made of teak. And in some of the flea markets around Johannesburg, I'm seeing more and more masks carved in Mozambique and in Zimbabwe representing a chitaul. The eyes are huge, round, with slits through which a person can see, and the lips are non-existent, and so is the nose. I've seen hundreds of such masks being sold by curious sellers in the streets. What, one of the other things that comes up in terms of the way they look is, is the domed head. Now, I was in Egypt um, recently and uh, saw uh, depictions of Nefertiti and uh, the Akhenaten um, family, and they had big domed heads. Um, is this uh, a connection? Yes. Yes, sir. You see, <coughs> we human beings tend to imitate those creatures that we call gods. It's going on even now. When African women saw white people, they named them Abelu, which literally means the gods. And today, in America and in Africa, black women and some black men are going out of their way to give themselves hair, which is European and not African in character. Now this thing say, was, was, it dates back thousands of years. First of all, the, the one race of the Chitauri, the ones that are called Nomo or Nomo in, by the Dogoni people, are depicted say, as having beard-like growths of the same type that look like the beards of Egyptian pharaohs. Mm. They are shown having, it is said say, that when a Chitauri gets very old, after tens of thousands of years, he, he or she develops a bone-like growth under the chin which twists around like the horn of that kind of fish-like creature I saw in Europe in a picture called a narwhal and this thing curls up this way now Egyptian pharaohs used to wear beards like that mm -hmm. and some African kings wore beards like that real beards or even false beards made out of ivory or out of the tusk of a white hawk. And the, there, is a, there was a time definitely in history say, when African kings as well as Egyptian pharaohs went out of their way to imitate the appearance of the Chitaur. Queens like Nefertiti had their fa faces misrepresented by the court painters. 
They looked exactly like the Chitauli estate, as near as possible. The high cheekbones, the drooping chin, the unusually large head. African Sangomas, African Inyangas, ancient Egyptian pharaohs, all of them used to wear headdresses that made their heads look much larger than they actually were. If you look say, at the crown, certain crowns worn by Egyptian kings, the whole head, the crown, is intended to be an extension of the pharaoh's head to give the pharaoh an appearance of above average uh, intelligence. In Africa, we had kings who favored headdresses made out of the scrotums of elephants or, or rhinoceroses or even buffaloes. A scrotum which was dried and made bulbous and worn on the head by the king to make his head look larger than it was. And lastly, in ancient Greece, at the time when Greece reached the, high, the great heights in its culture and civilization, the great ruler Pericles used to wear a special soldier's helmet with a bulbous skull, a helmet which made his head look much bigger than it really was. Do and they still do that today? Do they, do, are there still African traditions that do that Yes, today? yes, sir. Yes, very much so. And in America, some Native American shamans used to wear a special head made out of this, the head and the horns of a buffalo, which also made the, 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 the man's head look bigger than it is. Say, popes, the pope in Rome, wears a head which is intended to show him as having a brain bigger than average. That crown which has got one, three crowns, one on top of the other one. And now, bishops, especially in the Greek Orthodox Church, they wear crowns like that. And the Tsar of Russia, one of the Tsars, wore a bulbous crown which was in two sections which made his head bigger than it really was and in Persia in Iran some ayatollahs wear a turban which whose effect is to make the man's head look bigger than it is so does a Sikh and so for that matter, to the ancient priests of Israel, they also wore an onion-shaped uh, headdress whose, whose impression was to give him a far and above size head. There, there, aren't there also um, traditions in which they um, manipulate children's heads as they're growing to so yeah. that they become more yeah -like. yeah during my troubles troubles in africa say i came across an amazing people whom you must visit they are called the mangbetu people and they live near lake rudolph in central africa they are a beautiful aristocratic people and what they don't know about the universe is just not worth knowing. The Mangbetu people believe that an elongated skull with a flattened forehead pleases the gods. They, they, they flatten the skulls of their children, causing constant headaches to the child even when the child has grown into adulthood. And I asked a, a beautiful Mangbetu woman, Madam, why do you torture 
your children this way. The woman, the wife of a senior chief, said to me, Look, the gods want us to be like this. The story that you're telling, Credo, from the African perspective, is it in effect the same story as told in the um, tens of thousands of uh, clay tablets uh, found in what we now call Iraq, who become known as the Sumerian tablets, that talk about a race of gods called the Anunnaki, who um, came in and brought knowledge, ruled the people, and interbred with them? Yes. Do you say, therefore, that the Anunnaki in those uh, stories that have increasingly, of course, been translated in a number of books, yes. they were reptilian, you say? Say, all I do know is this, that here in South Africa, amongst the Khoza people, amongst the Zulu people, there are beings who are very revered even now, and they are called Amanuna or Amanono. Amanono is Zulu, Amanuna is Khoza. Now these beings are godlike beings, we are told. They can change their faces. They can change their appearance. They can shape shift. Yes, sir. they are shape shifters. A Manuna, a man, now if if a Khoza man has married a very beautiful wife, a wife whose face seems to change every day, he teases that wife by calling her his Inuna, Linunalam. In other words, a shape shifter. Say, it is said that the, the people who are closest to the hearts of the Manuna gods are women. And why? Because the women give to the Manuna the power of, they worship the Manuna. The hero worship them, which explains why Nefertiti wanted herself to look like one of them, and her children too. She was actually hero worshipping these creatures. And the, 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 the how you say, women say, are copycats, and I'm not being sexist when I say this, Women will copycat any being that they think is supreme. In Egypt also, um, you have the, the python-like headdresses, which are, are pretty obvious when you look at them, that the pharaohs were um, connected with. Yes, sir. And the reptile has played an unusually strange uh, part in the culture of all African tribes. For example, it is my suspicion that we black people of Southern Africa are going to be deprived of our nationhood in the very near future and that we are going to be ruled by people of Uganda. But wait, what is the real meaning of the word Baganda. Baganda. And what is the creature that you see depicted in, on the walls of houses and on the roofs of houses of some of the greatest empires in Africa? It is the python. There was a golden python which was used as a decoration on the roof of the, of the house in which the king of Benin, the Oba, lived. Zulu people revere the Mamba, a very terrible snake. Zulu people 
revere other snakes as well and in a vendor in the northern Transvaal the, the vendor people regard the snake as well as the crocodile as sacred and they even today their girls dance at initiation a, a, a long rather sinuous dance representing the movements of a python and they call that dance the domba dance and domba is the ancient name for a female python well wherever you look all over the world whether it's the mire of central america you look at south america africa anywhere that the symbolism of the snake the crocodile the representation of the reptilian is there you go into europe and the illuminati created uh, cathedrals like notre dame in paris you've got the stately homes of the aristocracy etc uh, with the gargoyles the reptilian figures it's been in our face but we just somehow have had a blind spot to see it we human beings have idolized the reptile since the very supposed birth of our history go even further say, much further what was the creature which was honored by the ancient greeks in their delphic oracle the python what is the creature that stands next to the figures of the goddess Athena? The python. No matter where you look, go to China, where I once went. Who are the principal characters who brought wisdom to, to humankind? Creatures, part snake and part human being one of whom I remember correctly was called Nu, a, a word which occurs also in Africa, and her brother was Kua, Kua, and sometimes it's turned into one creature, Nu Kua, she. Every way we, we human beings has, have sacrificed our dignity as a species, and attributed great intellect and great glory to reptiles, tortoises, turtles, s lizards, snakes. Why? And even now, say, our fascination with the reptile and the amphibian has not stopped. In fact, it's growing. The popularity of all those dinosaurs in cartoon as well as in serious form it makes me uneasy. If we could just pick up this line of, of bloodlines which the Sumerian tablets talk about, which you talk about, the interbreeding of humanity and the, how the accounts explain that these crossbreeds were put into the positions of royal ruling power, almost as like demigods, um, middlemen between the gods, the Chittahuli, the reptiles, and the people. Um, those bloodlines in my own research um, became the European royal families and aristocracy and today are the ruling banking business and political and royal lines of the world um, and the genealogy supports this increasingly is there a tradition also that the royal lines of Africa go back to the same source please you don't have to believe me go to Rwanda and there talk to the people there. They will tell you that they, the founding ancestors of their dynasties, the first kings who came from the sky and they were called Imanugela, the ascending ones say many 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 African tribes believe that when the gods came down from the sky they found human beings very very stupid and the human beings could not come before the gods in order to be taught 
So what the gods did, and this is a story that you also find amongst the Dogoni people in West Africa, because the, the, the human beings were afraid of approaching the, these reptile gods, the reptile gods cold-bloodedly slaughtered one of their number and shed out its flesh with a specially gathered crowd of human beings. And these human beings then became the ancestors of our first great kings. Now say, African kings jealously guarded their blood. If the royal lines of Africa claim descendants from the same source, basically, have those lines interbred as obsessively as the European aristocracy and royal family and not bred outside of those lines? Yes, sir. Royalty had to marry royalty. That was one of the strictest laws in ancient times. Which is obviously where we get the, the term the divine right of kings from. It's not actually God, it's actually the gods. Yes, sir, yes, yes. Royalty intermarried with royalty. You, could, you were not allowed to take a common as your senior wife if you were a king. You could take commoners after your senior wife. Yeah. Once the gen genetics has been achieved. Yes. Now, another thing, it is like the Sangomas. Very, very strictly speaking, a Sangoma who was sometimes viewed as a king or a queen was not allowed to marry outside her caste or his caste. Sangoma had to marry Sangoma, otherwise the non-Sangoma blood would pollute the god blood inside the Sangoma. The um, lady that I've quoted in my books, uh, Kathy O'Brien, who wrote her own book, Transformation of America, about being a mind-controlled slave of the American elite, um, she talks in there about seeing George Bush um, as president and vice president shapeshift into a reptile. And, and so many other people have told me this story of world leaders today uh, changing into reptiles in front of their eyes and then changing back again. And Miguel de la Madrid, the president of Mexico at the time of George Bush, said to Kathy O'Brien, as she quotes in her book, that an, a reptilian extraterrestrial race interbred with the ancient Central American people because they needed to create bloodlines through which they could operate. Yes. And he said that these bloodlines were, in effect, today's world leaders. Does it fit with your knowledge, Credo, that the royal lines of the Chittahuli reptilian human interbreeding that become the demigods and the royal families, etc., that they have gone on in Africa as well as the rest of the world to become the ruling uh, lines and the ruling people of these countries? Yes, many of them have. Said. In fact, some of Africa's most terrible warmongers, men who have drenched large areas of Africa in unnecessary blood and suffering, are directly descended from some of our greatest emperors of 600, 500, or even a thousand years ago. Just as the American presidents are. Say, I would like to tell you about a man called Jonas Savimbi. Jonas Savimbi is a descendant of some of the greatest Angola kings. In fact, the entire land called Angola was a breeding place of kingship in Africa. The, the word Ngola 
Angola means a king and Angola means land of many kings. I must say the way that the evidence that I'm uncovering uh, is going and it's going there very fast it, and it syncs so much with what you're saying is that a race from the stars, a reptilian race, interbred with humanity, they created um, crossbreed bloodlines which became the middlemen, the demigods, the royal kings and lines and uh, ruling power in the ancient uh, world and through interbreeding has become the presidents, the uh, ruling uh, people in, at the top of the power structures of banking, of politics, of the military, um, of all areas of our lives, of, of, uh, of business, all of it. Um, is that the way that you have seen it yourself? Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Ike, I wish for one moment I could, co I could contradict you. But for the last 40 years, I have observed an extremely disconcerting phenomenon in South Africa and in other parts of Africa as well. And this is the phenomenon. You find a rising black leader, a real leader amongst men, a ferocious activist for the rights of his people. This man starts something, whether it's a revolution or whatever, he starts it. And you look at his ancestry, because in Africa we, we look very closely at a man's ancestry. And you find that this man is nothing. Although he is doing such great deeds, he is actually a, a, a descendant of very peasant people. Ow. And you are worried. And all of a sudden, this black man will come to a sudden violent end and a person who is totally new will take his place. And when you look at the ancestors of these people, this man, you find that he or even she is a person of very, very ancient royal, African royalty. Now, let me show you. There was this war in Rhodesia, and many people got killed there. And there was a very fierce and dedicated general. His name was Tongo Gara. And Tongo Gara fought in Rhodesia. And just when victory was won, Tongo Gara was killed in a terrific explosion. Somebody put a bomb thing in his car and killed him very badly. But wait, Tongo Gara had been a descendant of a blacksmith. His surname Tongo Gara means powerful hammer. Now, who replaced Tongo Gara? A man called Robert Mugabe. Now you can't get more royal than that. Mugabe is descended from ancient Mashona kings and what is more he knows it. Always a leader is removed and, a, and when the power really comes a new leader descended from some faraway monarch or tribal chieftain two centuries or three centuries ago comes on the scene. Again and again there seems to be this particular force which elevates its descendants over ordinary human beings. 
I can give you hundreds of cases of this. Now say, talk about a tradition of shape shifting. African kings, even now, and even ordinary tribal chieftains, especially in times of crisis, often spread the story through the land that they are able to change shape at will. There was a time when the South African government created the various Bantu homelands, and these homelands were ruled by those tribal chiefs who were agreeable to the apartheid system. Now, some of these chiefs were very unpopular with the people on the ground. And so, to build a charisma around themselves, these chiefs used to tell people that they are capable of changing shape at will. It was spoken about a certain African chief in the Transkai who became one of the first rulers of one of several black homelands there that one day his enemies were, were looking for him to assassinate him and when they broke into his house they found a huge lion sitting on the, on the floor and this lion growled at them and because of that story because even today word of mouth is a very powerful media of communication in black communities all enemies of that particular chief left him well alone because they feared his shape cha changing powers the final question on this particular video, um, Credo, because we've got a lot more to say on others. Um, why is it that if the Chittahuli are all around us, which I certainly feel they are, um, and they're operating certain bloodlines, now some people see them shapeshift. That's absolutely without doubt. I mean, so many people I've met all over the world have seen it. Um, into reptiles and then back again, the George Bushes, the Henry Kissingers, uh, these key people. Um, why don't most people see it? First of all, sir, I have said to you, Mr. Ike, that we human beings have got a blind spot in our brains. And this is what the Chitauli and other alien nasty boys are exploiting. Look, sir, if we are a crowd and we are standing on a city street, we will see a man suddenly grow an extra arm. And many, many of us will see that, but will refuse to accept what they have seen. I have seen, sir, people going through severe trauma, in train accidents, in car accidents, but they refuse to accept what they went through. I have seen women who have been raped several times, ferociously refusing to admit what, went, the, 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 what they underwent. I've seen it many times. And these alien creatures say, know our weakness. They know that very often we human beings tend to censor what we see. If, if you are an educated professor and you see a spook, your educated mind will refuse to accept what it has seen. You will reject it and throw it to the back banner of your brain and it will stay there. Hundreds of us see very strange things every day, but we refuse to accept what we see. Say, one of the things that a trainee Sangoma has got to, to learn, it is the ability to see. If I am standing here and looking at that bush over there, 
and I see something odd there. I must know what I've seen. But wait, sir. There is something else. Something very, 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 very important. Which I and many other thinkers in Africa have found. Mr. Ike, whenever you talk about such things, people call you paranoid. Mm -hmm. But no, you are really more sane than they really are. Say, there are certain vaccination things that are done to our children which rob them of the ability of seeing spiritual entities. Believe me, I can prove this. In Zululand, we were sometimes called before the chief, before our chiefs, our Ingos, and we were told that there is a great smallpox coming to the land and that all children must be vaccinated. Do you know that my mother's father, my grandfather, used to dodge that? He said that the white man's job the white man's vaccination makes you blind. And if you are to look after my cattle, you must not go to the trading store to get your vaccination. But wait, the school inspectors used to come into the land and check each child for signs of vaccination or lack of it. Now, do you know what we used to do, Mr. David Dyke? Our grandmothers used to give us great pain in order to save our spiritual eyes. They used to heat grains of maize and then they would heat this grain of maize and using two pieces, a piece of wood as tweezers, place it firmly against the skin of the child. So when the school inspector came, he saw these blisters and assumed that the child had been vaccinated, but in fact it had not. And this was done to us many, many times. And I noticed that school children in mission schools who had been vaccinated for smallpox or four missiles, missiles could not see spiritual entities at all. A, 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 a Ndondo, that is a flying saucer, a spuputek, would fly through the sky at great speed and be seen by many men and women. But the child who had been vaccinated would see nothing. And I noticed this hundreds of times. Well, what you've just said about the vaccines and their effect and shutting us down spiritually and multidimensionally uh, is fantastic, given that um, no matter what your background, creed, culture, parents on every inch of the planet almost are being pressurized to have their children vaccinated more and more and more. And to summarize what you've been saying, um, and indeed it's so much in line with what I've come to the conclusion about as well. Um, an extraterrestrial race, reptilian race, disconnected us from our true magnificent senses um, in a long, long ancient world. They've been manipulating us ever since, and the more that time has passed, the less we've realized this is going on. And now we're at a point where we are in a prison without bars, a massive prison um, and we don't even know we're in prison, we don't even know who the jailers are. Indeed, when the jailers are exposed, people just laugh and ridicule and all that stuff. So we're in a, an unbelievable situation. And we're, at, it, we're, we're in a jail we deny we're in. And there are jailers we deny exist. And we call it freedom. Yes, sir. Yes. You know, Mr. David, the reason, one of the reasons why I've joined forces with you is because 
I have serious reason to believe, and I will repeat these words until somebody shuts my mouth in death. I have serious reason to believe that on this planet things are coming to a head and our invisible jailers are going to fight tooth and nail to prevent this. Say, our people say that the blackest night often heralds the brightest dawn. The human being, captive as he is, slave as it is, is trying to fight back, say. And this is where the crunch is going to come. I believe that we are not far away from the bloodiest crunch in the world. And I will tell you, my visions tell me that we are going to be struck with the most terrible sword of all, the sword of money, say. Something is going to be done to money which will bring us all to the level of beggars. And do you know why, say? Let me tell you. I used to work for big game hunters in Kenya. And one of them was an Italian gentleman. This Italian gentleman was such a, a powerful hunter, a white hunter. He used to shoot two bull elephants a day in Kenya. And he used to celebrate the shooting with a huge bottle. He called it a, ma a magnum of wine. I remember him pouring some of the wine onto the heads of the dead elephants. And then, one day we went with this man to the land now called Rwanda, which used to be called Rwanda Urundi. We went up the mountain and there, accompanied by pygmies, he shot a gorilla, a huge ngangi with silver fur all along its back. And the great beast died so bravely that this Italian hunter started weeping like a woman. He fired us, told us that the job is finished, and he never hunted again. Say, what I'm trying to tell you is this, that something inside us human beings is beginning to fight back against the Chitauri. Something inside us human beings is beginning to say no. And the Chitauri are going to drag us all right into hell itself in order to, re to restore their power over us. Let me show you. Who would have thought in the 1950s during the time of the Cold War when everybody was expecting a bloody that world war between Stalinist Russia and the Western nations, when British, American, and even Russian nuclear bombs were exploding all over the place, who would have thought that a few decades after that, there would come a time when a group of young men and women the people of Greenpeace would sail their ship, the Greenpeace warrior, into a nuclear zone to prevent the French from testing one more atomic bomb. This tells us uh, that something inside the human soul is fighting back. Forty years ago, it was once a very glamorous thing to to kill animals. Today, a big game hunter like my Italian friend would never dare show himself in some hotels. He would be spat at and he would be beaten up by people because the hero of yesterday, the Buana Banduki, the gun Buana 
of 40 years ago is today a murderer. Now, things are coming to a crunch. 40 years ago, nobody cared a damn about the environment. People did not even know that there existed such a thing as an environment or a food chain. Today, there are people who would rather lose their lives than not save a buck which is drowning in a river. A God is being born inside us, all of us, but herein lies the danger. We must be aware of the Chitang. They are a real entities. They leave scars on human bodies. They kill people. They are murdering South Africa even as we are talking now. Every word you and I are speaking now is spoken too late, Mr. David Icke. AIDS is rampaging through our communities. And I have found a new disease in Botswana, which nobody is talking about even. It is 20 times more vicious than AIDS. It is called Ebola. Oh my God. And we, we must please be aware. Let nobody laugh when we talk about conspiracy theories. But there is one thing said that I beg that you and others like you should discard una momento, as they say in South America. Stop calling the conspiracy a theory. Mm. Theories do not kill people, Mr. David Ike. Theories do not murder innocent children. Theories do not put multiple murderers of Kabila's stripe into power in countries. Absolutely. Theories are just ideas floating in the air. This, the conspiracy is real. It is there and it kills. The staggeringly intelligent, the staggeringly wise and the staggeringly knowledgeable Kreda Mutwa. And his knowledge the world needs to know. Not only is Credo a man who has gathered this enormous knowledge together, he's a man with the courage and the foresight and the wisdom to know that the world needs to hear this, even though most of the world, particularly those who run the world, don't want anyone to hear this. But if we're going to be free, and we are, then we need to know all there is to know, and not just that which the few want us to think is the world when a very different world is unfolding all around us every day. In the next video, we're going to be taking the story on with Credo and showing how these reptilian bloodlines and this Chittahuli, this reptilian group, expanded their power across the world, took over Africa and other great continents, and today are the ruling elite that controls planet Earth. And by knowing that, and by knowing how it's done and how it works, we can take control and power back into our lives from those who have controlled us and this planet for thousands of years. It's a great time to be alive from Africa for now. Thank you and thanks for listening to A Remarkable Man. Hello and welcome for a second time to Africa, the countryside of South Africa, just outside Johannesburg, for the second in our series with Credo Mutwa, the Zulu Sanusi, or shaman, as many people around the world would call him, the keeper of the history, the true history of Africa and the Zulu people. 
and the official storyteller, in other words, the carrier of the knowledge and the symbolic stories of the Zulu nation. He is, without any question in my mind whatsoever, the most remarkable, astonishing man it's been my honor to meet. And to share his incredible knowledge has been a time I personally will never forget. In the first of these videos, we discussed with Credo uh, the story of the Chittahuli, the reptilian extraterrestrial race from another world that came to the earth in the far ancient world that brought advanced knowledge which built many of the according to conventional history unexplainable magnificent structures um, all across the world thousands and thousands of years old and also interbred with humanity creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines these bloodlines as my own research uh, for books like The Biggest Secret and Credo's immense knowledge of the African history uh, which he's gathered in his nearly 80 years of traveling this vast and amazing continent both correlate the same story remarkably that this Chittahuli, this reptilian race interbred with humanity and the bloodlines became the almost demigods, the royal ruling lines of the ancient world, particularly in the ancient Near and Middle East, which were the middlemen, if you like, between the extraterrestrial gods to which people were literally sacrificed and the people in general. And as the genealogical research is showing, these crossbreed bloodlines, the Nephilim, as the Old Testament of the Bible calls them, the result of the interbreeding between the sons of God, as the Bible calls them, the sons of the gods in the true translation, and earth women. The marriage, the uh, bringing together of the sons of God and the daughters of men. This Nephilim crossbreed race, as the genealogy has shown, came out of that area and into Europe to become the aristocracy and the royal families of Europe and then through the British Empire became uh, the ruling bloodlines of most of the world. In fact, today, almost all of the world. Like the 42 presidents out of the hundreds of millions of people who have been Americans since the Declaration of Independence in 1776, 42 have become president. They're all related. What? And they go back to these ruling aristocratic families which eventually go back to the crossbreed uh, inter relationship inter course between the Chittahuli, the Anunnaki as some accounts call them and human beings and it's the British Empire that we're going to talk about now in its relationship to taking over the planet in a way that today is now global. The British Empire um, became the British Empire because this network of bloodlines, which had become known as the Illuminati, centered itself in London at operational level, uh, particularly after the arrival from Holland of William of Orange, who became King of England in 1689. And from that time, um, he signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the banking system as we know it started to expand and emerge. But from that time, the British Empire and the other European empires came into being, and they took the planet over. Now, one immensely important area that they completely controlled and raped was the fantastic continent of Africa. And to look at how Africa was taken over by this Illuminati, Chittahuli, reptilian crossbreeds, and uh, indeed the reptilian race itself that's behind it all, is to see how the world has been taken over, the methods used, the way it was done, the manipulations. And what we're going to talk to uh, Credo about now, among many other things, is the way that the continent of Africa was hijacked by the Illuminati. And I asked him first to tell me the story of how this great continent was taken over. So, there are mysteries in this world that we as thinking human beings must look into. And 
one of these mysteries is this. There is overwhelming evidence of the fact that before Africa was actually colonized by the white people from Europe, it was first prepared by strange people for this colonization. When the first Portuguese ships started sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, strange beings appeared amongst our people, strange human-like creatures, usually creatures of great height, abnormally tall, human-like beings, some of them with only one foot, appeared amongst our people and they started doing things there which, which made it easier for the colonialists to invade us and to conquer us. What were they like in terms of their color and skin, Credo? Say, we do not know, but there are those who described them as very, very white, chalk white in appearance. <coughs> this went on for so often that it became traditional to our people to represent these beings with white chalk. You found masks amongst our, our mask makers which were smeared entirely in white chalk to represent these creatures. These creatures were usually about eight feet tall very, very slender, and they used to wear robes made of the, the tanned hides of certain type of antelope, usually the, the intensely black sable antelope. What, what name did the uh, people give to them? We gave them the, 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 the name Izilo Zengubo the beasts of the terrible blanket. These creatures were dressed exactly like Christian monks with hoods and long robes. In fact, I will draw you a likeness of one of them as it is shown in a rock painting. Now, these creatures used to live in holes in the ground or in 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 uh, 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 underground uh, uh, in underground caverns or in 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 gullies over which a roof of logs and and vegetation as well as swords was placed and it may be of interest to you sir that Portuguese explorers and Portuguese seamen used to see these one-legged creatures hopping about and sometimes disappearing into the ground as if by magic. And these creatures were called by the Portuguese sailors monopods. They wore a long robe that reached down to their ankles and they appeared as they moved through the bush as if they only had one leg. Monopods were seen in Africa and they were also seen in America before America was colonized by the white people. Among the Native Americans? 
Yes. Sir. The, one of the <coughs> one of the things that amazes me is that the story of America and the story of Africa was the same. It is said sir, that these monopoles introduced certain knowledge to our people. They actually prepared our people mentally for what was to come. For example, these monopoles, these uh, beasts of the terrible blanket, used to wear a cross-like ornament on their chests as a charm, a cross made of either gold or silver. Doesn't it amaze you that when the Native Americans saw the cross painted on the on the sails of Christopher Columbus's ships, they recognized it as a sacred object. Let me tell you, sir, exactly the same happened in South Africa where our people were made familiar with the crops long before the white man set foot in Africa. And when our people saw this cross, this time brought by missionaries, they recognized it as a sacred object. In other words, now, I don't know how to put this there, but can you put it for me? Our people were prepared long beforehand to, to recognize certain Christian symbols and Judaic symbols. And when they saw them in the hands of the colonists later, they saw them for what they were. This is one of the reasons why, Mr. Ike, Africans accepted and protected Christian missionaries even while fighting a life and death struggle against white colonialism. How is it that a man would accept the religion of an invader while at the same time fighting a life and death battle against the encroachments that this invader was making into his native land. This happened in America, and this happened in Africa, and the, 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 the sources of this uh, 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 acceptance were the same. I, I wish I could put this in much better English than I'm, use, I'm using now because I feel it is important. I, th I think you, you, you're putting it um, very clearly that it seems that this Chittahuli um, were uh, going around the world preparing for the uh, occupation from the Illuminati Center in London and Europe of these various areas like Native America and Africa. Yes, sir. The, the, the story, you see, a great fraud is being committed in educational circles in that the educationists in their ivory towers force our young people to look at the colonization of Africa and America as if they were two separate uh, 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 incidents. But certain factors in this colonization were the same in Africa and the same in America, and they achieved exactly the same results. This is why I always argue that the conspiracy, the international conspiracy, began long 
long before colonial, colonial times in Africa and in the Americas. <coughs> and the results were the same. Look at this. Here is the great Zulu king, Shaka. Shaka is a warrior second to none. Shaka is also a prophet second to none. Shaka welcomes white people <coughs> to his empire of Natal. Shaka allows missionaries to operate freely through his country. And when Shaka dies, before Shaka died, he warned his half-brother, Dinga, that he must, under no circumstances, attack the white people, and that he must allow missionaries to operate freely amongst the Zulu people. In fact, during the reign of King Dinga and Shaka's half-brother, two missionaries, Reverend Halstead and Reverend Owen, had a mission station within sight of King Dingan's great village. But wait, sir, let me point out one thing. These missionaries were converting our people to Christianity, and they often went out of their way to criticize and undermine the king's authority in the eyes of their converts. In other words, we have an amazing phenomena here where a great king is being undermined by the very people he has allowed to preach freely in, in his country. Why? Not a single South African scholar has ever asked himself why. Why, <coughs> why were our people so seemingly stupid as to allow a foreign religion into their country? Now, let me show you say, two horrendous tragedies. When the Belgians colonized the Congo, which is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, King Leopold declared that the Congo was to be his personal property. And King Leopold and his men tortured and murdered several million black Congolese people in an act of genocide equal only to what the Nazis were later to do to the Jews. But under savage ill-treatment, under savage torture and humiliation, the Congolese, virtual slaves in their country, still respected Christian missionaries and followed them and gained hope from them. And in 1907, this time in the country today known as Namibia, the Germans embarked on a policy of genocide against the warrior people known as the Hereros. They murdered so many Hereros. They tortured and slaughtered so many men and women of that, of that nation, nation that for until as recently as the 1940s, Herero women were still so traumatized by what had happened that they were not producing any young at all. But in spite of the hideous genocide committed by General Van Trotha, 
in spite of the multiple murders, the Herero people clung to the Christian faith. Why? Exactly why? Our, I now come to my people, the Zulus. When King Dingan murdered the four tracker leader, Peter Thief, the act was watched by Reverend Owen and Reverend Halstead from their mission station, which was built on a hill overlooking King Dingan's great uh, village. Halstead and Owen, unharmed by Dingan, decided to flee from the place after that. And Dingan was deeply sorrowed that his favorite preachers had decided to leave him. And King Taitwayo, the warrior king who won the Battle of Isandwane in 1875 or thereabouts, never harmed missionaries. And a king who followed Taitwayo, King Dinizu, who was brutally tortured by the English, had a great friend in reverend in Bishop Colenso, a Christian bishop, and his daughters, one of whom was called Mary. Although he had suffered so much at the hands of the British authorities, King Dinizulu never abandoned his white Christian friends. They comforted him and he depended desperately upon them and their Bible in his darkest hours. Would the same basic story credo be true of how the British um, or the Illuminati based in Britain um, took over Australia to Yes, I have found exactly the same stories. The Aborigines, like Africans, were deliberately softened up long before they, they were colonized by the white people. There were men, mysterious men, who often posed as gods, who who undermined the will of the Aborigines to resist the encroachment of the colonialists. It's also interesting that Captain Cook, who is the guy who's supposed to have, quote, discovered um, Australia, New Zealand, that area of the world, yes. was actually sponsored and funded and, in fact, controlled by the Royal Society, which was a Freemasonic and is a Freemasonic a science operation based in London. Yes, sir. Let, let me show you another interesting thing. There is a man I have been investigating in vain for over 40 years now. A man who committed acts of hideous genocide upon our people here in South Africa. A man of whom historians are so fond that he is practically a white cow whom you may not dare to point a finger at. If you see me sitting in front of you, a man who was demo demonized over 30 years ago by the South African news media, it was because I asked questions about this white man, Sir George Gray. Who was Sir George Gray? What was he? Was he a Freemason? Was he an Illuminati? How is it that this Sir George Gray, who is the, the actual founder of the most oppressive laws that British colonialism ever settled our people with, Apartheid 
was laid down by Sir George Grey. The carrying of identity papers was laid down by Sir George Grey in the, in the 1850s, in the last century. And Sir George Grey dealt our kings a mortal blow. But let me first tell you, this man was sent from London to quell a Maori rebellion in New Zealand which had defeated the efforts of military men. The Maori were unstoppable. Their rebellion was blazing like a bushfire through New Zealand. But when George Grey was sent to New Zealand, he managed to quell this rebellion with very, very little loss of life. What did George Gray do? I have never been able to find a book which tells me exactly what did George Gray do in New Zealand in order to pacify the Maoris who had beaten the efforts of the, sol the British soldiers. Because that same George Gray was brought from New Zealand to South Africa in order to quell a great rebellion by the Khoza people. And George Gray used outright trickery in order to force the Khoza people to actually destroy themselves. George Gray deliberately and cold-bloodedly tricked the Khoza people into slaughtering their own cattle, burning their own crops. It is one of the saddest stories of our country's blood-drenched history. And almost overnight, George Gray reduced the Khoza people of the Eastern Cape into a nation of dying skeletal starvelings because after, after George Gray had manipulated the causes with a raw trickery into destroying their crops, destroying their cattle, he practically had them on the plate. Hunger, raw hunger and starvation achieved what military might had failed to, to achieve after many, many embattled decades. George Gray was a psychologist par excellence. George Gray was a trickster who knew the native races and he knew how to exploit their beliefs to, their, to bring about their own destruction. Let me show you what Gray did. One day, when great tension was boiling up in the Cape, and when the, the colonialists were threatened by yet another border war between themselves and the, and the Khoza people, a number of women were, at, a number of Khoza women, amongst them a Sangoma, a priest, priestess diviner called Nongaus were tending crops when they heard voices calling out to them in the bush. Nongaus, because she was a spiritual person and a healer, responded to these voices. She went together with her sister Nondeto to investigate and they found a deep hollow in the ground and from this hollow they heard the voices coming. And as the women knelt next to the hollow, the 
three amazing figures emerged from the grass. Tall men wearing long black robes made of animal skin with very big hoods on their heads appeared out of the hollow and one of their faces were painted white or so it seemed to the terrified Kosa women. And they were, these men were unusually tall. And they told the, the woman, Nongawuse, whom they distinguished by her attire as a traditional healer, that she must go to the Kosa people and tell them to start killing their cattle and start destroying their crops. Mr. Ike, I want to show you this book, a book which was published many years ago, a book written by me and which made me one of the most hated black men in South Africa by the white establishment. In this book, I write, amongst other things, about a man called Sir George Gray. And I, in this book, I questioned certain things about this man, because Sir George Gray was the creator of race discrimination and apartheid in South Africa. Apartheid was not really created by the Africaners. It was created by this man many, many years ago. Well, Sir George Gray was Illuminati, um, a black magician, and uh, fits the bill exactly with what happened in all these other countries you're talking about. Say, when I questioned the when I raised questions in this book about Sir George Gray, I was savagely attacked by nearly every professor in various universities of South Africa. The intellectual prostitutes, yeah? Yes. The liars in ivory towers, as I call them. I asked, I said that the 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 causes did not commit suicide in 1857 they were murdered they were manipulated by sir george gray into destroying themselves isn't it interesting cradle uh, i've noticed this myself that the story you just told about how those people were manipulated to kill their cattle and what have you um, is mirrored again and again in the story that has spawned religion after religion. I mean, whether it's Mohammed or whether it's Joseph Smith with the Mormons, again and again, the, the initiator has a vision or an interaction with some god figure or angel. And bingo, they get told to do certain things and the, the rest is history. Yes, sir. And what is most interesting is that these interesting angels have suddenly disappeared in recent times. You no longer hear of an angel coming to tell some prophet to establish a new religion. No. Where have they gone? They, they carefully choose certain times. Now, Sir George Gray said, so let me go back to him. He manipulated the Kosa people into killing themselves. And a poor woman, Nongaus, became the scapegoat because in every evil thing that has been done in Africa by the white colonialists, as well as by the Arab colonialists, there are always black scapegoats who are left holding the blame. And in this case, Nongaose was.
according to Af- to South African official history books, we are told that Nongawuse had had a dream that her people must kill their cattle, her people must kill, destroy their crops. And as a result of Nongawuse's dream, thousands died. And another lie was added to compound this infamous lie. We were told that Nongawuse had been a child when she had this dream. But that's a lie. Photographs of Nongawuse taken after the terrible disaster show her as a mature woman who is wearing a beaded blanket. And on that beaded blanket it is shown clearly in beaded patterns that she was a Sangoma who had undergone several initiations. She was not a girl but a spinster woman in her 25th year. And Nungawuse had not had a dream whatsoever. She had seen apparitions. She had seen men who posed as gods, who were disguised as supernatural beings, and she had not been alone. And another thing, the Kosa people would never have li- listened to the word of any mature child on a serious matter like this, because to all African people, cattle and crops were not regarded as their property, but rather as the property of the ancestral spirits. Now, Nongawuse became a scapegoat. For a long, long time, our people hated Nongawuse for the dream she had supposedly had. And After I had brought questions about this story, after I had been torn apart by newspaper men, Nongaus' story was suddenly changed and totally omitted in South African history books. I can show you some of these books where this story doesn't occur at all. Taylor, is this uh, story that you're telling in, in this uh, uh, one um, incident, can you um, repeat that again and again um, across southern Africa as the um, Europeans took over? Was it a method they constantly used? Yes, uh, yes. You see, I can tell you a lot of things that were done. Some of the bloody wars which were started in South Africa between white men and black men were actually engineered by supposedly ancestral spirits where a king suddenly saw an apparition. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you, sir, one of these amazing stories of which there are well over a hundred. And it is a true story that is known to every student of history in the land known as Lesotho. There was a great king. The king's name was Muthomi. Muthomi was a priest king. He was a man who was both a healer and a king. 